Thank you so much, uh, Mark. I have the privilege and honor of introducing him at the conclusion of tomorrow's business meeting. So uh, esteemed guests, uh, meeting organizers, uh, Drs. Krause, uh, Drs. Myers, our guests of honor, I'm, I'm so honored to be in front of you today to provide this presidential address on the care of the head and neck cancer patient is a team sport. Um, the, the theme for my presidential year has been to highlight the value and importance of the multidisciplinary team in providing compassionate, quality, and patient and family-centered care for the head and neck cancer patient. The care provided by the head and neck cancer surgeon along with colleagues in medical and radiation oncology are what we typically and have historically considered the primary members of the team. <clears throat> Upon further reflection, however, we must all recognize and acknowledge the value and efforts afforded our patients by a diverse cadre of healthcare professionals without whom we could not possibly provide the care we collectively aspire to deliver. These team members include nurses, physicians assistants, speech pathologists, dentists, oral surgeons, maxillofacial prosthodontists, social workers, radiologists, anesthesiologists, nutritionists, medical assistants, and administrative assistants. And I'm sure I've left a few out. Discovery of the novel treatment paradigms that offer improvement in tumor control and patient outcome require the efforts of scientists and clinical trialists. Results of experiments and clinical trials require the expertise of biostatistician to tell us what is a significant result. The new age of genomics, proteomics, and next-gen sequencing have created a new discipline, that of the bioinformatician. Thus, there are many critically important members of the multidisciplinary team that provide care for the head and neck cancer patient and define the future of that care. In this address, I will discuss the four M's I consider important in the care of the head and neck cancer patient. Oops. Multidisciplinary care, mentorship, mission, and mindful living. Let me begin by discussing multidisciplinary care. This requires leadership and teamwork. Thankfully, there are many great examples of extraordinary leaders that have promoted incredible teamwork. I'm going to share with you one of my favorites. We want the Big Ten Championship. We're going to win it as a team. They can throw out all those great backs and great quarterbacks and great defensive players throughout the country and in this conference. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than a team. No coach is more important than a team. A team, a team, a team. And if we think that way, all of us, everything that you do, you take into consideration what effect does it have on my team. Because you can go into professional football, you can go anywhere you want to play after you leave here. You will never play for a team again. You'll play for a contract, you'll play for this, you'll play for that. You'll play for everything except the team. Think what a great thing it is to be a part of something that is a team. We're going to win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. Better than anybody else in this conference, we're going to play together as a team. We're going to believe in each other. We're not going to criticize each other. We're not going to talk about each other. We're going to encourage each other. And when we play as a team, the old season is over. You and I know. Michigan, yeah. Michigan. 
So I know we're not a football team in this audience, but I do believe there are important lessons to be learned about teamwork. Next slide, please. So another exceptional leader is John Wooden, and he has these quotes uh, that I'd like to share with you. A coach is someone who can give, give correction without causing resentment. I think that's an important lesson, as many of us teach the future surgeons and specialists to provide this care. And the main ingredient of stardom is the rest of the team. So you have to work together in a team, listen to the members of your team, and respect their opinions. So I'd like to uh, present a case study, which is the University of Michigan Head and Neck Oncology Program. Uh, and this is a, an example of a highly functioning uh, team. And there are many important characteristics of this team. But first of all, there's a lot of members. And I put individuals on this slide, but there are many individuals that are radiation oncologists. Dr. Eisbrook is a former presidential citation winner here. Uh, Frank Worden is one of my recipients today. He's representing the specialty of medical oncology. Tammy Miller, representing the specialty of nursing. Teresa Leiden, rep representing the specialty of speech pathology. Dr. McCurgy of radiology. Uh, John McHugh, pathology. Tom Carey and Silvana Papadrakis, tumor biology. Uh, Tim Johnson, our colleague, uh, my dear colleague in dermatology. It does take a village. At Michigan, we have six head and neck cancer surgeons. Kelly just joined us, uh, and we said farewell to Basu Devi, who joined uh, Stanford University's program. But the qualities of a highly functional team are what is critically important to providing this care. Trust, commitment to excellence, respect for one another, open-mindedness, and willingness to listen to and hear the ideas of team members. Really enjoying and valuing working together. Recognizing the diversity of talent and perspective. And ultimately, believing that what you do can make a real difference in the lives of our patients. And what you are trying to accomplish is a noble goal. The second M is mentorship. Mentorship and fostering career development is a critical element of a highly functional team. Some of you may know Tom Carey, who is our associate chair for research in, the depart in our department at Michigan. I would like to highlight Tom Carey as an outstanding example of mentorship and the qualities that are critically important to being an outstanding mentor. He was recently awarded a Distinguished Mentorship Award at Michigan. I had the privilege of nominating him and assembling several outstanding letters of support. I wish to share with you the quotes shared at the awards ceremony from some of his mentees. Dr. Carey instilled in me a passion for and a commitment to translational research, which has proven to be a driving force in my career decisions. He has never ceased in generously giving his time and energy to mentor me. Dr. Carey's influence on me is now reflected in the way I mentor my own students. So these are important lessons for us to remember uh, is in what it means to be a truly outstanding mentor. And I'll, notice, I'll note in the picture on this slide that Dr. Carey has fostered the careers of many, including four departmental heads and one intramural NIH investigator shown in the picture. Mentorship is exceedingly important if we are to reach our mission to train tomorrow's leaders. Training tomorrow's leaders involves development of what Aristotle calls a virtuous person. This approach is best described by Aristotle when he wrote, to do this to a person to the right extent, at the right time, with the right motive, and in the right way. That is not for everyone, 
nor is it easy. Wherefore, goodness is both rare and laudable and noble. Our collective goal should be to provide mentorship to our trainees, students, junior faculty, and staff in such a way that they too exhibit integrity, passion, and excellence in all they do and become someone others seek to emulate. Today, please consider how you can make a difference by offering advice, guidance, or mentorship to a colleague or trainee. Then what is our mission? I would state that our collective mission is to, ought to be choosing the right treatment for the right patient at the right time and defining that care moving forward. We must consider the patient, the family, the tumor, the patient's goals of treatment, and the toxicity of treatment in our decision-making process. For example, how important is preservation of voice and the voice box in the patient with advanced larynx cancer? In palliative care, are we considering the quality of life as well as the quantity of life? We as physicians must not be wedded to a particular tool, be it the robot, the laser, or the surgical scalpel, because we know the saying, if you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But we must have a complete toolbox of treatment modalities from which to draw upon to strive to achieve the goals of treatment. We must advocate for the patient, not the technique. We must remain objective and hold ourselves to a standard of high level of evidence in order to provide evidence basis for our treatment decisions. As the pendulum swings back to surgical modalities for head and neck cancer, it is imperative that we conduct the relevant clinical trials to provide this evidence basis. Such efforts are underway under the auspices of the Head and Neck Steering Committee of the National Cancer Institute and the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group to study transoral approaches for early and advanced oropharyngeal cancer. These efforts are very commendable. We must create and foster a culture of in investigation in each of our centers of excellence. We must learn something from each patient we treat by enrolling patients in therapeutic or observational clinical trials. The goals of treatment should include curing the cancer, preservation of function, quality of life and quantity of life, limitation of treatment toxicity, and preservation of dignity and independence for the patient. The modern physician-patient relationship is based upon the same characteristics of a highly functional team. Trust, dignity and respect, excellent communication and information sharing, and collaboration. And we've heard even this morning at the uh, panel preceding this session about patient being at the center of our decision-making process. We must explain to our patients the various treatment options as objectively as we can and partner with them in the decision-making process to ensure we are making the best decision for that patient given these considerations. Furthermore, we pro must provide this care in a coordinated, patient, and family-centered fashion. So what is patient and family-centered care? It really is bringing the perspectives of patients and families directly into the planning, delivery, and evaluation of health care, thereby improving quality and safety. It's partnering with our patients uh, in a true sense uh, to improve health care. 
and I'm going to share with you a video describing that. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I think it's a different way of thinking about patients and families at the center of our care. And things have changed a lot, but I, I'm convinced that they can change even more. And that's why I chose to share that video with you. So head and neck cancer remains an orphan disease. It's not very common. Thus, it is challenging to achieve a highly functional multidisciplinary team in every community. There is a growing body of evidence in the literature that the number of patients treated at a center correlates with outcome. Receiving treatment at high volume teaching research facilities was associated with improved survival in advanced larynx cancer as shown in this study published by Amy Chen et al. And similar findings were observed in an e earlier publication for patients with early larynx cancer. There is also evidence that in patients with recurrent head and neck cancer referred to the MD Anderson Cancer Center, a significant number were not treated according to NCCN guidelines uh, at the time of referral. In my own practice, I have seen clear evidence of inaccurate staging and delayed detection of recurrence. Thus, we must hold ourselves accountable collectively and to not dabble in head and neck cancer. I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say 
you should be an expert in the care of the head and neck cancer patient to provide the top quality of care. To be an expert, you must participate in a highly functional multidisciplinary team. You must, you really should enroll patients both in observational and therapeutic clinical trials. And you need to coordinate their care. You don't need, we, sh we ought not to leave patients to their own devices to try to coordinate that care. We need to coordinate that care for the patient. If you are at a center who, can, who cannot achieve these criteria, you should refer to a center where these criteria are met, are met. I would be remiss if I did not provide a brief comment in the era of healthcare reform in the U.S. as it relates to our mission of providing care. I have always admired the outspokenness of Atul Gawande, and I trust many of you are familiar with his work. In a recent essay posted in the New Yorker, he states the following. Beneath the intricacies of the Affordable Care Act lies a simple truth. We are all born frail and mortal, and in the course of our lives, we all need health care. Americans are on our way to recognizing this. If we actually do, now that would be wicked. Now that's wicked good, not wicked bad. So my last M I'd like to talk about, and thank you for Dr. Wax for sharing some slides of me uh, in the pursuit of mindful living and strategies to heal thyself. Uh, we heard a little bit about this yesterday, but take time, all of you, to look after your own health because we cannot be physicians for our patients if we are not uh, taking care of our own health. Uh, guard and defend against one-dimensional living, uh, which is, can be defined as all work and no play. Do not let email and tasks needing to be completed take away your time to enjoy life. I encourage each of you to take an email holiday. I also hope that you each choose to be present for the important events in your family's lives. I encourage you to engage in meaningful hobbies. I believe fundamentally that these behaviors will make you a more effective physician, a better team player, a better mentor, a better role model, and a better leader. Though far from perfect, many of you know that I do enjoy uh, tennis, uh, running, and spending time with my family, some of it at our lake home. I am terribly proud to have raised two wonderful children. Uh, Taylor, now 19, you saw him, who has completed his freshman year at the University of Michigan and is planning to study computer engineering. He is not able to be here uh, this week because he's leading the tennis program at Camp Michigania, a family camp in northern Michigan for alumni and faculty at the University of Michigan. And on that um, Block M Rock, that's our family at camp every year. In fact, I left, we left that vacation to come here uh, for this meeting. When he captured the state title for four doubles uh, in tennis his senior year, uh, I was able to be present. Uh, my daughter Morgan is 16 and reached the Eastern Nationals for Level 9 Gymnastics this past May. Uh, I was also able to be present. I'm accompanied today by my husband of 30 years, Dave, and my daughter, Morgan. I'm very appreciative of my family's incredible support over the years and my husband's willingness to take on many household responsibilities despite full-time employment as a project manager for a local heating and cooling company. I will close with a true story that I hope many of you in the audience will appreciate given the demands of a busy career and, for many of you, family. 
One time when my son Taylor was in grade school, I was going through some of his schoolwork. When I happened to see his handwriting notebook and happened upon a page where he was asked to indicate who was his hero and why. You know, boys uh, don't talk much about what they're really thinking. If you have a boy, you might know that. Um, imagine my surprise when I read my mom because she helps people with cancer. So in closing, I encourage each of you to consider the legacy you will leave with your family, your patients, your colleagues, your trainees, and with your communities. Consider outreach opportunities like some of the examples shown here conducted through the University of Michigan with trainees, uh, nurses, uh, medical assistants, audiologists, and our plastic surgery colleagues. It has been truly uh, a sincere privilege and honor uh, to serve you as the first uh, woman president of the American Head and Neck Society. I stand on the shoulders of the giants who have led this society and the two societies that formed this society before it. Um, it has been the pinnacle of my career, and I am so very thankful to have been given this opportunity to serve this organization and each and every one of you, and most importantly, our patients and society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. I, I'm very humbled. It is now my sincere privilege to award uh, presidential, citation to very, presidential citations to very deserving recipients. If I could first call Tammy Miller up to the podium. Um, Tammy has uh, been our oncology nurse coordinator for the past 17 years. Prior to that, she worked on the floor uh, to coordinate home care for our patients. I tell my patients, and they all know it, she's my right arm and half of my left. She enables patient and family-centered care in the true definition of the words. Um, our patients love her, and I could not possibly do what I do without someone like Tammy. I'm truly blessed to have such a colleague and such a dear friend. And uh, Tammy, this is your presidential citation. Um, Teresa Leiden is uh, unable to be here uh, due to a very recent uh, death in the family, and she, uh, her mother-in-law passed away. Um, so she's unable to join us today, but she sends her sincere uh, regrets at not being with us today. Teresa Leiden drives over an hour to come to work at the University of Michigan every day. She's a speech and language pathologist who evaluates and treats communication and swallowing disorders in our patients. She's active in clinical research. She runs our head and neck oncology support group. And if that wasn't enough, she also ran a, an Odo t-shirt fundraiser so that patients who could not afford speaking prostheses uh, could be uh, given these through a donated fund. Um, one of Teresa's patients uh, sent me, my patient also, sent me an email today because I'd announced at support group that both Tammy and Teresa were to receive presidential citations at this conference. 
And this uh, fairly young woman had a, a laryngeal rhabdomyosarcoma that did require sacrifice of her voice box. She told a very poignant story in her email to me about how Teresa came alongside her sort of at the lowest point of her post-operative course in the hospital and reassured her that she would both speak and swallow and actually would be able to communicate prior to leaving the hospital. And this patient is doing very well. And Teresa is one of these extraordinary individuals that makes a huge difference in the lives of these patients. And again, for speech pathologists in the audience, for nurses in the audience, you're a key member of the healthcare team. And I honor and acknowledge all of your efforts and specific, well, uh, specifically, uh, I will be giving Teresa her award uh, when I see her next, but she's not able to be here. Um, Suresh McCurgy is our uh, rate neuroradiologist and division director for neuroradiology and head and neck oncology at Michigan. When he learned of his presidential citation, he'd already arranged to be on a cruise somewhere far away. So he's also not able to be with us. Uh, Dr. McCurgy is a great colleague and friend. He actively participates in the University of Michigan Head and Neck Oncology Tumor Boards uh, and shows us exactly where the tumor is or where to biopsy. He's critically important in the care that we provide. He's known to say the statement, just draw a line down the middle. And with this, he's taught me and many of our trainees and colleagues how, how exactly to interpret uh, advanced neuroradiology studies. Um, he's also counseled the head and neck surgeon who's heading into surgery that this tumor, this one is sneaky big, is another one of his quotes. Um, so he informs us where tumor has extended beyond what we might consider the usual con confines of the tumor extent, so to ensure that we're able to eradicate the tumor with our surgical approaches. And he also tells us, or helps inform us, when surgi surgery might not be the right approach because the tumor has extended beyond the surgical uh, arena. So again, Dr. McCurgy is most deserving of a presidential citation, but is unable to be here today. Uh, if I could call Timothy Johnson to the podium. Um, Dr. Johnson was the individual who single-handedly got me involved in the multidisciplinary melanoma program at the University of Michigan. He is a brilliant, dedicated, and talented dermatologist and Mohs surgeon who has long been a mentor, collaborator, trusted colleague, and friend. When he invited to me to participate in the melanoma clinic in 1997, I did not know at the time the impact that this would have on my career. Through the teamwork and efforts of the melanoma program, I learned to perform sentinel lymph node biopsy, a technique largely known only to the surgical oncology community in the 1990s. Like the head and neck oncology program at the University of Michigan, the multidisciplinary melanoma program is a shining example of a great team dedicated to provide the very best care for the melanoma patient. And he's accompanied today by his wife, Lori Lowe, who is a talented, unbelievably tan talented dermatopathologist also at the University of Michigan. Tim Johnson, congratulations. If I could call Frank Worden up to the podium. Frank is our medical oncologist at the University of Michigan. He helps run a large number of investigator-initiated and industry-sponsored clinical trials that will inform the future of head and neck cancer care. He was a pharmacist prior to becoming a medical oncologist, so he's very good, outstanding, at symptom management in our head and neck cancer patients. Furthermore, he provides 
uh, compassionate palliative care for our patients when a cure is no longer a possibility. In conjunction with talented nurse practitioners, he developed a weekly nurse practitioner clinic to manage patients' uh, symptoms in patients receiving intensive, intensive multimodality chemoradiotherapy. In doing so, they were able to decrease hospitalizations and increase the number of patients receiving all intended chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Uh, Frank is a fabulous colleague and uh, represents here all of the medical oncologists in our community who are critical to the care we provide. Thank you, Frank, for this honor of being a presidential citation. So my last uh, award to present is the American Head and Neck Society Distinguished Service Award. If I could call Dr. Ashok Shaha to the podium, please. Thank you. So Dr. Ashok, as I said, is this year's recipient of the Distinguished Service Award. Dr. Shaha is a well-known and talented head and neck surgeon, thyroid surgeon. He is a great educator, a great speaker, and has been a role model for many of us in this room. He has served our society uh, and the Advanced Training Council in a remarkable fashion. He served as the Advanced Training Council Secretary from 1998 to 2001, and then as the Advanced Training Council Chair from 2002 uh, to, to, through 2012. Ashok, I wish to present you with a plaque that states the f following. Um, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. This is a quote from Mahatma Gandhi and is so fitting for Dr. Shaha's service to our society. So with deep appreciation for 17 years of service, we thank Dr. Shaha for his dedication. <laughs> 